got some friends here following along. So if you are just joining us, welcome to the Sullivan Foundation uh, Navigating the Unknown series. Hopefully my mic is working for you. It's a Friday, everything's deciding to take a break. So uh, we're gonna do what we can here. So we've got uh, some really great friends joining us. Um, I'll pull up the slide here so you can see those. So we've got Jared and Crystal joining us. I just saw Jared pop in. So Jared, give me a thumbs up in the comment section if you can hear me to make sure my, my audio is working for everybody. So we've got Jared joining, uh, who's from the Biomimicry Institute, um, which is an amazing organization doing some really great stuff. Cool, yay, now we can hear, pumped. So Jared is on, I'm on, that's two steps there. Uh, and we've also got Crystal joining us down from Durham, North Carolina. She runs a bunch of different uh, groups and organizations, nonprofits, social enterprises. And so we're gonna be talking about environmental sustainability impacts that are happening around this whole COVID uh, crisis. And the first person that we're going to invite here uh, is Jared Yarnall Shane. Uh, Jared is a good friend. Uh, we actually met through one of the ventures that I run here in State College, Pennsylvania, where I'm based at, uh, and where Jared is also based at at the moment. Um, and so he currently works for an organization called the Biomimicry Institute, uh, which does some incredible work. I'll let him tell a little bit more. And he also has a background in running a variety of social enterprises and startup uh, companies. So. We're gonna bring Jared on to the call here. So let's see where Jared is at, if I can invite him in. Let's see if our technology is working with us today. Friday, you never quite know what you're gonna get. Look at that, we've got two faces on the screen. We're here. Hey, you're... how's it going, Jared? Good, good, good to see you and hear you, Spud. I know, I feel like we're only like spitting distance from each other. We're just like, you know, a couple miles down the road, but we haven't seen each other in a while. I know. Yeah. We'll change that as soon as we can. <laughs> Hopefully so. So yes. well, thank you for uh, joining uh, here with the Sullivan Foundation. Um, we are excited to hear what you've been up to. I'm personally very excited. Um, so was wondering if you could give the viewers here and the Sullivan community an idea of who you are what you do, um, which could be a variety of things at this point with you, uh, and how has your life started to look differently because of all of this COVID stuff that's going on? Yeah, uh, three great and big questions. So <laughs> I'll start um, with what I'm doing now with my work at the Biomimicry Institute. So um, we're a nonprofit organization that is um, trying to popularize this idea of looking to nature to inspire solutions to some of our world's biggest challenges. Um, and we look to nature in three kind of unique ways. So the first way is through what we call emulation. Um, so nature has evolved um, amazing strategies throughout millions of years of evolution to solve really complex challenges. Everything from like waterproofing materials to um, making uh, antibacterial surfaces. Um, nature's done it all. So how can we learn how to kind of uh, mimic that, um, that function or that strategy? Um, another aspect that we bring uh, with biomimicry is this aspect of ethos. Um, so everything created in the natural world is, um, is, is friendly for life. We like to say it's, it's life friendly. Um, it exists based on basic building blocks of carbon and um, it's, it's powered by the sun. So how can we bring that ethos into the different companies and designs that we make? Um, and then uh, the third aspect is, is personally one of my favorites and I think one of the most powerful and that's the reconnection aspect. So um, how can we truly appreciate and embrace um, our natural world? And we think that by giving people experiences to go to some of the most biodiverse places in the world, um, they're going to just come back with this new sense of appreciation and have a totally different view on um, the end of life of a lot of their products and, and different things that they um, might contribute to, yeah, just harmful practices. Yeah, you were, where were you just at uh, a little bit ago? Yeah, so we just got back from our entrepreneurship expedition in Panama. So we flew into Panama City, um, traveled through um, a couple different kind of stages of forest from farm field to uh, secondary forest to primary rainforest. And we had 35 young entrepreneurs there. Um, it, yeah, it was awesome. It was great. That's awesome. I, for those who don't know Jared, Jared has like, I feel like equal passions for nature and entrepreneurship and you working at the Biomimicry Institute is such a perfect uh, blend of those two passions for you. So. It's been fun to watch all of that evolve yeah. over the years. Yeah, thanks, bud. It's been a ton of fun. Yeah, 
Yeah, so how, how are things starting to look different, right? You're with Biomimicry mm -hmm. Institute, and maybe how long have you been there? And I'm yeah. curious how that's shifting for you a bit. Yeah, so I've been at the Biomimicry Institute for about a year. Um, and before that, I, I have had a couple of my own small ventures in uh, urban agriculture to creating a tool deck, kind of like Spud just shared with you. Um, and oh, I probably have you probably have, yeah you probably have it <laughs> <laughs> I'll go find it for you yeah um so and yeah so I've I've had this kind of crazy experience of studying mechanical engineering um, moving into this world of social entrepreneurship and now uh, kind of bridging that that social entrepreneurship world with this environmental um, kind of conservation lens so specifically at the Biomimicry Institute, I'm the entrepreneurship director. I help run our entrepreneurship and commercialization programs. So how do we um, get these nature-inspired solutions out there into the world? Um, and most of what we do at the Institute and actually our staff, we already work remotely. So we've been used to kind of this work from home, working digitally and creating this program content that could go out there. Um, and how work-wise we've been adapting is more so around meeting the needs of our participants. So we have, in addition to these startup training programs, we also have youth education programs as well as college education based programs. Um, so youth that's like middle and high school, um, because they're all transitioning to this learn from home environment, um, we're working closely with uh, teachers and educators to either change up some of the requirements for our programs extending the, the deadline and I think most importantly is, is creating new content for them. Um, we're all kind of moving into this, uh, we need high quality digital content and that's what we're, we're trying to help create. So. And I wonder if you could give a taste because I think we've got a lot of folks in the Sullivan Foundation network that may wrestle with this part of, you know, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life, right? This is a bigger mm -hmm. conversation than just the COVID impacts that we're, we're going through right now, right? So I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. Do I start my own project? Do I go work for another organization? Do I go travel the world and just drop everything? I feel like you've had a, a taste of everything. And so I wonder if you could just like quickly bring people up to speed of some of the different, you know, milestones that you've taken to get to this place that you're working on right now, because it's a really interesting opportunity. Yeah, yeah, it has been a really kind of interesting journey. And, and like Spud mentioned in the beginning, um, I grew, so I, I like to always say it starts with where I grew up. So I grew up at a camp. Um, so for those of you who have been able to go on a, a Sullivan Foundation retreat, it's a camp very similar to some of those that you probably experienced. Um, and uh, yeah, so I grew up just being out in nature, taking people out to look at the stars and asking some really deep and powerful questions while we're doing that. Um, came into college and just fell in love with this idea of, of creating, creating what's next and what's new. And doing that um, to help make sure that we all have an equal chance at life. That's kind of been a core and primary drive of mine. And so started that in the agriculture space, was very fortunate to join up with a, a group called Thought for Food, which I love, which um, is, a, is a, a worldwide organization that's helping to find um, these next gen um, food and ag innovators. Um, and helped start and launch that um, startup program and, and helped really to, to grow and drive that. Um, and then when I was looking to transition and start working a bit more locally, um, I was able to actually start uh, consulting, a small, very small consulting practice, uh, doing work with Penn State University. Um, wasn't really looking for op job opportunities. And then um, a friend, a good friend of mine sent me uh, this biomimicry institute position, uh, combining the startup and, and nature world, and and jumped on it. So that's kind of that's the path. And like you mentioned, but um, along the way, there was definitely this period of kind of soul searching for me. So after I um, left my first startup, I I essentially quit that, um, left a pretty serious relationship, and moved to take a job in Kenya. <laughs> and within a week, I quit that job. Um, it just, it turned out to be more or less a scam, <laughs> which I learned a lot through that process, but, um, this set right. me off on this path of kind of self-discovery. Like what, what do I do now? How I, I felt like I couldn't necessarily come home, but for the first time I was, uh, just truly out there on my own. And I wanted to keep exploring that, even though it was really hard. 
-hmm. So I, uh, this is when I started working with Thought for Food, which allowed me to work remotely. And I was able to um, hop around to Kenya, to Portugal, to Switzerland, to Colombia, to Peru, all while working um, remotely for this awesome organization. Yeah, you have had a chance to bounce around and check a lot of different boxes, I think, for what a career looks like and how to kind of pursue that. So if you have questions and you're just joining us on the feed right now, feel free to add them down in the comments section if you're curious about the scam that Jared got himself involved in. Uh, maybe we'll go there if people are curious. But, um, but I'm curious um, around your role with the Biomimicry Institute, right? Like, I keep seeing all these stories of how nature and wildlife are like taking over cities and you know reclaiming places that used to be human run and are now you know dolphins in the canals and in Venice and all that kind of stuff so i'm just curious what your perspective has been working with the biomimicry institute are you guys part of conversations or are you hearing things differently than perhaps the rest of us because you're so in tune with what can we learn from the natural world to inspire the ventures and the projects and the systems that we create in the human space. So I'm just curious what those conversations have looked like for you. Yeah, um, it's it's a great and it's, it is something that we're talking about a lot. Um, and I think first and foremost is um, what we what we all are need to figure out is how do we combat COVID-19 and how do we respond to this and kind of come out of this on the other side. And that's really where we see our role. Um, in, in being is how can we help that dialogue to look to be one of resilience um, and regeneration um, as we as we come out of the, the pandemic. Um, and there's some really great examples of that in nature um, that that are happening. One of the startups that we've supported is called Nucleario. They're based in Brazil and they um, lived in the Amazon rainforest and have seen how that has been getting um, cut down and destroyed. Um, and but what they also noticed was that um, how seedlings would uh, grow in the underbrush. And oftentimes the ones that were successful was this mix of kind of leaf litter um, and, and other kind of water retaining um, surfaces to uh, make sure that they had enough nutrients, but also to protect from other predators from kind of coming in. Mm -hmm. So they created this design mimicking all these different aspects of nature um, then it actually increases reforestation rates by like 50%. Um, I, I don't have the number, it might even be higher than that. Um, so there's a great example of if we really pay attention to how nature naturally comes back through these things, we might learn some strategies that we can help and implement into our, um, our built structures and our built environment. Hmm. Yeah, there's a, I, I'm not gonna get it totally right, but I believe there's an organization called the Bracana Institute um, that for a period of time, they're really inspired by, right, the natural world. And uh, they, they were trying to figure out, you know, strategic planning and where do we go next as an organization? And they realized, right, in nature, it's okay to like have a, a dull period, right? Winter when things just kind of are dormant uh, and we don't do anything. And they decided to do that with their organization, right? We're just gonna like go into a dormant phase for a couple months, a couple of years, and we'll see what emerges on the other side. And so. I've been personally thinking about that a lot during all of this because so many nonprofits, right? I run some, you're connected to, I'm sure a bunch are all wrestling with what does our long-term longevity plan look like and how does you use the word resilience? How does resilience fit into that picture, right? So does it make sense to force it and try to stay alive? At what point do you just say, Hey, maybe we need to actually, you know, close down for a little bit and then reopen. So yeah, I'm curious, yeah. have you yeah, seen organizations or like the groups that you guys are connected with? Like, how are they having that conversation right now? Yeah, so I think with the groups we're working with, there's kind of three different things that are happening. Because uh, most of most of who we work with are not location based or like um, businesses or, or small businesses. And I think that there's um, those are oftentimes the ones that are getting hit with a lot of the most. Um, yeah. Uh, they rely on foot traffic oftentimes, and you can speak to that, Spud. So, um, so most of ours are more in the, I would say, the like high tech materials space or um, chemistry, or um, even when you're kind of in the food and ag space, um, where people need to continue to eat, and people and those companies have been adapting in some really interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I think there's there's been three responses I've been seeing. One is actually people are shutting down and this is for that high-tech kind of materials um, R&D space they're shutting down their lab 
and focusing efforts on um, how do we respond to COVID-19. Hmm. I've been super impressed. There's a robotics startup we worked with that the technology came out of MIT um, and a ventilator is essentially a, a robot that helps make sure people can breathe. So they've um, amassed this really amazing team in Boston um, of about 250 volunteers to create this low cost uh, ventilator. So I've been super impressed with their response and saying, hey, let's put our startup on hold and focus on this problem that's mm -hmm. affecting us all. I think uh, the second path that I've been seeing is um, more or less people continuing as normal um, with the caveat of oftentimes they can't do their work in their uh, building or lab and the sales cycles for some of these things are a little bit strange. So they're um, maybe either pausing operations or, or shifting focus to think more about who do we hire onto the team? How do we build a strong team culture? How do we get some of our processes in place? And then um, that last category is, yeah, people who are getting hit hard by, um, by the economic impacts of this all. And uh, I think there's a lot of really good resources out there. First Round Capital just put out a really good playlist on, or um, playbook on what you should do. Um, the Kauffman Foundation also had a really good um, kind of list. So those would be two resources that I'd recommend to check out. I know you, at least in the past, I'm not sure if you still are mm -hmm. um, connected to like the social impact investing scene. Mm -hmm. um, have you given those three different types of responses that you're seeing startups and companies kind of uh, choosing how to navigate with this? How are you seeing funders respond? Um, yeah. I know at least, you know, I'm connected to some of the nonprofit spaces, like some are, you know, relaxing uh, their stipulations for what you could spend money for. So in the impact yeah. investing world, have you seen any changes in terms of how people are responding? Yeah, I haven't really had too many touch points um, with that world um, recently. So can't 100% can't answer that, I think. Looking at the Biomimicry Institute, um, we are in a really exciting period of growth where we, we have been fundraising now for about a year and we're going to continue to fundraise. And um, so far, what we found is that people are still do have environmental issues top of mind and that there still is uh, support out there for that. Um, that being said, um, I think we're just entering into what this new economy is going to look like. Um, and, and we, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens six months down the line. So is your team starting to have that conversation of, you mm -hmm. know, given that the global uh, message around all of this is shifting, right? People's priorities or what they're focusing their attention on is changing. How are you beginning to position yourself, right? Biomimicry Institute to be able to respond to those shifting priorities six months, 12 months down the road? Like, are you guys thinking in those terms or are you thinking, how do we pivot right now to respond to the needs that are directly around us? Um, that's a great question. I, uh, our strategy, our, like our core program strategies, I don't think it, it hasn't changed very much. We're gonna keep our um, core programs uh, locked in. And actually, I think if anything, it's, it's gonna be even more needed now mostly because um, what we offer is mostly in the digital format. So our most popular website and program is Ask Nature. So if you go to asknature.org, we, we run that. You can type in like waterproof and it will show you how animals and plants have created waterproof membranes as an example. And um, so we're really excited to continue developing that. Um, for our youth programs, it's, it's going to be how do we help teachers teach in this new age of kind of digital learning. And for entrepreneurship programs, um, while at the moment we can't do these in-person events, we're coming up with some other creative ways to um, help them advance their business. And a lot of that revolves around some of our connections to the media and, and industry. So how can we get their technology in front of the people who, who may benefit from it? If you go on to Ask Nature, what was it, dot .com or dot .org? AskNature.org. Yeah. .org. It, what happens when you type in like how does nature respond to a pandemic or to a crisis? <laughs> like are, are those scenarios that you yeah. guys have input into the system? Yeah, so it, it, it mostly pulls from different research papers. So um, I did actually just type in disease before we hopped on. And um, some of the results are how, um, how termites, for example, rely on herd, not herd, but um, kind of group immunity. So same concept here is there's um, vaccines are so important because um, it protects those that can't get vaccines. So it's important that everyone is vaccinated um, so that those who are immunocompromised uh, don't, won't have 
have the ability to have it uh, transmitted to them. So right. yeah, there's examples in nature of how, how kind of like hives of termites and bees and other things follow that same practice. Fascinating. That is a, a part of this world that I know nothing about, right? The whole biomimicry space. Um, yeah. I, I want to be mindful of time because uh, we also have Crystal jump on in a little bit. Um, I'm curious, is there something that we as a Sullivan community can do to support the work you guys are, are working on? Or uh, is there something that you want to leave with us? Uh, a tip, a trick, a, uh, something you found helpful in the last couple of weeks as you've been navigating this? Um, yeah, so we, so I think my challenge for everyone is how do we take this time to reconnect? Um, I, I, Spud and I both, we both work remotely and a lot of our time is spent looking in front of the screen. Um, and I always try to challenge myself is how do I, how do I spend some time outside every day? How can I look at things maybe in a, a different light? So instead of just saying, like watching for example, all these squirrels in my backyard and it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, can I start asking myself, why are they doing that? Or why, why does their tail kind of move in that direction? And by doing that, you're kind of practicing almost like mindfulness in a way. You're, you're just being super attuned to what is happening. And um, I think for me, that's one of the best things that's happened for me working at the Biomimicry Institute is I'm starting to ask these why questions. And uh, I think that's the first step in that we need to take um, to, yeah, just get this idea of looking to nature and learning to nature um, out there into the world. Awesome. Well, where you live, I know there are a lot of squirrels. Uh, yes. So, you know, <laughs> plenty of opportunities for that. So uh, thank you for joining. Uh, this is Jared from the Biomimicry Institute. Uh, I see people in the comment section, asknature.org is very cool. Yes, go check out that. What other sites can we uh, send people to to know more about your work, Jared? Uh, also go to biomimicry.org. Um, so that will be where you can learn about all our different programs and also sign up for some of our programs because um, we definitely have things for, for college age students. Um, and if you want to see anything about my past work, just go to Jarnall, J-A-R-N-A-L-L.com. Awesome. Jared will hang out in the comments section here a little bit. So I'm sure you can chat with him if you need to. You guys have some great domain names, so I'm sure they were not uh, cheap. So <laughs> anyway, well, thank you for joining, Jared. Appreciate you taking some time out of this Friday. So go uh, enjoy some squirrels after all of this. So. <laughs> cool. Thanks, bud. Cool. See ya. Bye. All right. So that was Jared. Jared doing a lot of great work with the Biomimicry Institute. Um, I want to bring another friend in here, uh, Crystal who is equally well-versed in all of the travel uh, opportunities. She has traveled a good bit. Uh, she has her hands involved in quite a few different organizations. Um, Don't Waste Durham is one of her main groups, uh, but she'll maybe talk about some of the other stuff, uh, Green to Go and some other work that she's doing. So let me go ahead and queue up Crystal on the call here. And as we've got Crystal joining on, feel free to add questions and things that you've got down in the bottom. There we go. How's it going, Crystal? Oh, real well, thank you. Your voice got really quiet all of a sudden, Spud, just to let you know. Uh-oh, well, that's a problem. Well, I will have to just speak much, much louder and project to myself. And I want to say hi to Jared. I just realized I have actually met Jared. Um, Jared, I think we met last August in Minneapolis at Circularity 19. Um, you were there doing presentations on biomimicry, and I remember meeting you. So small world. Small world connecting of dots that happens yeah. a lot in the Sullivan community. So cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I feel thanks like we for having me. This is really fun. Yeah, we haven't had a chance to catch up since the fall, I guess, when we were at since the event. October. So I'm excited to hear what's new in your world. So if you could give folks on the call a little teaser, who are you? What are you doing? How are things looking differently because of COVID? Yeah, thank you. I'm hanging in there. Um, so uh, I have, uh, my name's Crystal. I have two little boys and it's been very interesting to have them out of school while also trying to work and also trying to homeschool them. I keep telling people I didn't sign up for this parenting gig to be a teacher, um, but I'm doing my best. Uh, so I run the nonprofit called Don't Waste Durham, which I founded uh, six, seven years ago. And our mission is to create solutions that prevent trash. And we do that in a number of ways. Obviously, education and 
outreach and advocacy, but also more importantly, uh, we do it through innovation, solving problems, and also creating policy change. Those are the, some of the things we're involved in. We're really, really uh, big uh, promoters of shifting our society to a circular economy. And we're gonna be hearing more and more about that in the mainstream. Um, it's really a way to make our way of life a lot more sustainable going forward because we can't keep up this take and trash economy that, uh, that we've been living in for um, in the past. I think this is a really, really interesting time right now to reinvent ourselves and reinvent the way we do things. So um, yeah, Don't Waste Durham has, uh, right now one of our biggest programs is Green To Go. So our Green To Go service startup is actually under our nonprofit at the moment. Um, there's some big changes in the works and some exciting things uh, to work on really scaling this everywhere. But interestingly, you know, uh, Green To Go is a reusable takeout container service. So we provide clean, reusable, sanitized containers to restaurants, grocery stores, coffee shops coming soon. And they keep those on their shelf and customers um, of ours come in and they use their mobile app to check out a re durable reusable container for their food or beverage. They take it home, enjoy it, and then when they're ready, they return it to any return station in town, which we have all over town. And then our staff comes with bicycles and trailers to pick up the dirties, wash and sanitize centrally, and then restock the restaurants. So our, um, it's an interesting time in the midst of COVID to yeah. be working in a space where you're using, uh, reusing things. Interestingly, um, Coffee shops like Starbucks um, have stopped taking people's reusable mugs for their coffee. So that's kind of a uh, company-wide policy they've, they've um, put in place now because of COVID. And Green To Go is actually um, very unique in a reuse program because we wash and sanitize centrally and then we restock the mm. uh, containers to the food vendors. So no one at the restaurant or coffee shop is ever handling a container brought from a person's home. So we are, of course, experts in health code and sanitation. So uh, sanitization. So our containers are really the cleanest in town. So uh, we have seen, as you, as I think everyone in the whole nation has perceived, that a lot of food right now is takeout and delivery. That's pretty much all we can do. And so what does that mean? We're, of course, very interested in this topic. It keeps us up at night. It's the topic of trash. And more and more trash than ever before has been generated um, by our new normal of ordering food online and getting everything delivered. And we're seeing that municipalities are actually really struggling with the new higher increased amounts of trash. Household trash is on the rise like never before. And we think with our unique um, service, our unique product, we can really do great things. Uh, we can help uh, prevent all of those disposables. So this has been a really actually exciting time for us. We feel like we can, now more than ever, we can help. This is something um, that will probably be a residual habit after mm -hmm. the outbreak, um, you know, subsides that, uh, delivery and takeout has has it's the future of food. Hmm. So right now we are um, really enjoying um, new opportunities. We've got a, a move to a new wash facility in our future, whereby we will go from having partnered with this tiny nonprofit to have two drying racks, to being able to have as many drying racks as we want to take on the capacity. Um, you know, of all of the sports stadiums and the schools and the retirement communities and every restaurant in town. And we can do that and um, really scale our impact um, with our own wash facility. So we're, um, we're doing a fundraiser for that and um, working harder than ever before. A lot of it, of course, online, um, and which has been actually kind of fun and interesting. 
I, I only get dressed up and wear clothes for these types of things. Um, Glad I can encourage it for you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyway, that, that's, a, that's a little introduction. Um, I have lots more um, cool things I want to share, but um, I want to hear what, what, uh, what you'd like to know. Totally, yeah. So if you've got questions, feel free to drop them down in the comments or the question section. Um, I think one of the reasons I love talking to folks like yourself and social entrepreneurs is because the things that get them so excited are like increased drying rack capacity. Like that's what gets you going, which is so exciting. <laughs> yeah, I stay up late looking at catalogs for di commercial dishwashers. That's what right. gets me going. <laughs> yeah, Who a life in, you know, a snapshot of the life of a social entrepreneur is not always what people think it is. So um, That's right. So I'm, I'm curious, right, because you, you touched on this in a couple different ways. So right on one hand, this whole situation is creating like, you know, increased urgency in a sense of we need to do something about the trash and all of a sudden everybody's doing takeout. So there's that piece. And then on the other hand, people are concerned about health and hygiene and cleanliness. And right. So they're probably rightfully skeptical about anything in that space. So how are you as a leader of this organization figuring out where to focus your energy and your time between mm -hmm. that balancing act of like on one hand, it's showing increased need and demand. And on the other hand, people are hesitant. Like, how do you fit in the middle of all of that? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's an interesting time. We have a lot of green to go partner restaurants in town, for example, they've all switched to delivery. And our customers, our green to go users, as well as the rest of the community, I think is really recognizing how much trash is piling up at home because of all this takeout. And we're still getting subscribers uh, to green to go We're selling subscriptions. I think people are seeing, wow, I really want to check out green to go instead of all having all of this styrofoam. And um, I think, I think we've done a great job. Um, really showing that, uh, you know, high heat sanitization is, it kills everything. And we are the cleanest boxes in town. Um, we haven't had any, um, anything with, uh, you know, the concerns about reuse coming up just because of the way we run, we run our business. Um, and there's a, there are probably in your town as well, a lot of efforts uh, grassroots efforts, government efforts to feed people who are falling through the cracks, like uh, people in public schools who aren't getting the meals they usually get. Um, there's a lot of um, on the ground uh, delivery, cooking and delivery services. And we're working right now on partnering with one of those to get the food delivered in reusable so they don't go through these thousands and thousands and thousands of containers every day um, that we can wash, pick them up, wash, sanitize, bring them back. So are you seeing your revenue increase, decrease, stay the same? Uh, do you have the capacity to suddenly provide, you know, reusable containers to all of the school districts in your area? I mean, what, how are you responding to that? Yeah, I mean, I think our working to increase our capacity with this new wash facility is very exciting to us because we want to be able to say yes to everyone. And so we do have inventory to help out where we can and, um, you know, looking for that stepping stone in between wash facility that can get us um, over the hump until our big one is ready. Um, yeah, I think we have, uh, we are on our way to being able to, to meet the needs. And um, there's all kinds of new opportunities now um, with, this, with this takeout business. So has your team had to change? Uh, like I would imagine suddenly spotlight is on this issue for you, right? And so everybody's thinking and talking about this. How has your team had to adapt and change? And what does your team look like? Uh, is it just you? Are there other folks? I mean. How have those like inner conversations happened with those that you work with? Yeah, we have a core team of eight. Um, only four of them are paid, not including me myself. Um, wonderful folks. We get together uh, weekly so that we can um, change and adapt quickly. Uh, for example, when COVID first um, appeared and we 
felt the need to right away communicate with our entire customer base about our practices. Um, we got together and um, hashed something out uh, very quickly um, with agility and got it out and you know adjusted our protocols accordingly. And that was really cool. It, it just felt like, um, you know, sometimes it's in times of emergency when teamwork really comes out. And I am so, so grateful for having the best team. Um, we have a operations manager who does the, who rides his bicycle and picks up the dirties. We have Karen who p does the restocking. Um, Jackie, um, our admin and finance person. And then we have Tristan, our digital marketing um, intern. And we've been on top of it in communicating and pivoting. So we're kind of redefining how we're going to work right now. And um, delivery seems to be what we're going to be moving into. And have you had, right, there's so much talk in the news right now around small business relief efforts and right the CARES Act and helping nonprofits that are really struggling. So where have you positioned yourself within your team in terms of what you're working on kind of as one of the heads of this? Are you helping out programmatically? Are you doing the communication stuff? Are you applying to loans and grants? I mean, yeah. Where's as your, as well, it I'll often is in startups, I'm just doing um, a lot of everything. Uh, but luckily, I have a lot of support in each of those things. But yeah, we, we did apply for a, one of those um, Paycheck Protection Program loans. Um, cross your fingers for us. That'll really help us get over the hump. Hopefully, the hump's not too big. Um, I wanted to mention one thing that uh, we were able to do that was very COVID-related that I feel very proud of. Just this past Monday, uh, we released a... Uh, a position statement and advocacy brief that I co-wrote along with Circular Triangle and Sustainable Duke. And both of those are, you know, local entities, but we have a lot of um, sustainability expertise between us and a lot of circular economy expertise. And two of us happen to be, uh, have public health backgrounds. So what we did was we co-wrote this advocacy brief um, with all of our research cited um, to show why um, if our country is to want national health security that we must um, create standard shared protocols for sterilizing and reusing uh, PPEs or you know the masks that protect us from coronavirus because of course there are alarming shortages right now and there's a lot of innovation so this has so much to do with the startup world uh, we were able to do some, all the research of all of the current innovations in sterilizing and reusing masks that has just come out in the last couple months. Uh, people are so creative, as we know. There's um, all kinds of interesting things like um, uh, UV light and um, these trucks with puffs of air and high heat that sanitize them so many different uh, ways in which these could be sterilized and reused. And what we really need to do is to act quickly and get these into um, protocols that we can use now um, to make sure everybody has enough. And that's in the short term. And in the longer term, we hope that um, these personal protective equipment will be manufactured for longevity and durability and, and sterilization. And those materials are sourced locally and the sterilization happens locally because what does that mean it does mean jobs that's very important but even more importantly as we've seen it will free us from the dependence on um, very uncertain global markets right we can't wait for china we can't wait for this um, national stockpile to give us what we need let's do these things um locally and we will be more resilient and we'll have national health security without having to wait on countries we don't know if they're going to ship us anything so that was very exciting that just came out this past monday a two-pager with a really strong stance and those are some of the kind of things that don't waste theorem can do um, um you know to advocate for um addressing these uh ridiculous shortages right
So if you're just joining in here, uh, we've got Crystal from Don't Waste Durham. She cares about trash. Um, so if you've got questions, feel free to add them down in the uh, bottom here for us. Um, I'm curious for you, Crystal, what would your advice be to someone who's like, I want to get involved. I want to help address the environmental impacts that are going mm -hmm. on specifically in my community, mm -hmm. but I don't have access to, you know, a, a sanitized cleaning space or, you know, 10,000 uh, reusable containers. You know, what can someone do from home to help address this growing environmental trash, the implications of COVID, whether it's around the mass or the takeout containers? I mean, how can someone get involved in this work in their own community? Yeah, I mean, I think pre-COVID times, um, I would have had um, had better answers. I think right now, so much of our um, food and products, we're ordering them, they're sh being shipped to us, they're being delivered, and all of this is coming in mountains of packaging. So it will take a lot of um, consumer advocacy, which is very hard because people are tired or sick or busy, and they don't have the time to call up these corporations and complain about the packaging. Um, I think that um, people who are good at writing could write some op-eds in the newspaper. Uh, bringing these issues to light uh, is really goes a long way. Obviously, writing to our elected officials, um, if you're good at writing and you feel so inclined, and supporting campaigns um, to end single use. You know, that's not a model that our world can sustain any longer. And as we've come to find out with all of our pilot projects, we're going to be transforming recycling as we know it, transforming a industry that is not doing well because the markets are failing and transforming their existing infrastructure into something um, that the reuse economy can use. So same infrastructure, but let's pick up reusables and sort them and redistribute them. Um, so uh, support, support the efforts of uh, groups that are working toward a reuse economy. And of course, there are ways you can personally um, reduce your waste. You know, if you, if you are picking out some broccoli, maybe don't put it in a produce bag. Just go ahead and wash it well when you get home. Imagine that. Um, so lots of things, you know, question your own um, single use habits. I think look within yourself. We have so much time to contemplate now. I mean, what is time anymore? Like what day is it? I don't know. So we have time to contemplate our single use habits. And that's what I encourage everyone to do. Totally. Yeah. I, I looked at my calendar the other day here on this wall and realized it's been like three weeks since I've like checked off, you know, the day that it was. And I'm usually religious. Like every night I cross it off last three weeks have been a blur. I totally forgot about time in general. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I had to remember what month it was. I wrote February the other day. <laughs> oh, if we all could only go back to February right now. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. You, you right. You said look inside yourself. I feel like sometimes with issues like this, people like it gets really heavy. People hold it on their shoulders. They take on this big responsibility that they've got to, you know, make these changes and drive them in their community. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a little snippet into you as an individual of how you handle this? Like, right, as you started hearing about the COVID stuff, right, it's easy to hear this conversation we're having right now and, and say, cool, Crystal heard all this. She doubled down. She started reaching out to the school district. She started doing this, right? And like, you're just like taking action. And maybe that has been what the reality has looked like for you. But I want to give you an opportunity to share, have there been moments where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to go sit in a corner and I don't know what to do. I mean, like, what's the personal dimension and journey look like for you as you're navigating this last couple of weeks? Yeah, so I think it's good for me to talk about like a hard thing um, that's been feeling overwhelming at times. Um, you know, we've, it's like a lot of things in trash reduction have regressed a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Um, when you know, when I, I read the news a lot about trash, it's just like my topic. I just am obsessed. I read about trash. I read about recycling. And um, one of the things that's come out is that, you know, the plastics industry, the people who make virgin plastic from petroleum, um, they don't use recycled plastic. They create virgin plastic. They're making an incredible amount of money. And they would love you to believe that single use is safer um, during these times. And so they've 
put out huge amounts of money in these campaigns and it's just not supported by the science. Um, I think, you know, as we're going to find out as the science um, comes out, you know, everything, anything can have germs on it. So including single use. Um, so when I, when I read about that, I, I got a sinking feeling that, oh gosh, we're, it's like, the trash prevention world is taking a little bit of a blow. Um, it's not that it's um, truth, but of course, it's public perception that changes habits. So, um, for example, I just heard that the Harris Teeter grocery uh, chain, I don't know if you all have that, or it's related to Kroger. Um, the Harris Teeter grocery chain has just announced they will not be um, allowing people to bring in their own reusable bags anymore, um, which is, it is not based in science. It's just, again, public perception. So we kind of have to ask ourselves, where are these mandates coming from? Um, what is influencing them? So that kind of, that kind of makes me sad. Um, as you may know, we're working with the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic on the proposed single-use fee on bags. But we've, we've kind of stepped back and said, okay, let's hold off for six to 12 months until things subside because the current public perception is, uh, is fear-based around um, you know, needing to have everything be um, crisp virgin plastic uh, disposables. Um, in their mind, that's um, you know, better right now. And that, that may very well be true. Um, so some of, that's some of the things that get me down. Sometimes I feel a little overwhelmed, but luckily um, not everyone is like this, but I'm just one of those weirdos who every time I see a problem, I just want to solve it. So, um, you know, we're very creative. We like say, okay, um, this is a roadblock. You know, how can we jump over it? So we just see berries and we slush them down. Um, that's, that's just my MO. So yes, I definitely um, shed a few tears over my coffee sometimes, but I've luckily got a really creative team that just wants to solve problems. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of problems to solve, so we're gonna always be in business. Totally. Yeah, we've been talking uh, on this series about, and I don't know if there, there's an actual scientific uh, breakdown of this, but we've been talking about the cycle of anxiety, grief, and creativity where there are times where it's just like, it's anxious, right? You're just overwhelmed. And then moments where you're really sad of like, oh, they really made that decision with, you know, shopping bags or whatever it might be, right? There's a moment of grief and it, you know, there's a range of grief that happens there. And then mm -hmm. there are moments of creativity. I think sometimes folks get frustrated that they can't easily jump into one or the other when they want to jump into the creative space, but really you need to honor the, the anxiety phase that you're in or the, the grief phase. Totally, you gotta honor that. We, um, we have this, to go hand in hand with the proposed bag fee, um, we were about to launch this month um, Boomerang Bag, which is a free and accessible circulating reusable bag program where we're providing sanitized, clean, reusable bags for free, accessible to all that people can take and keep or borrow and bring back. Um, we put that on pause for obvious reasons. But one thing it did for those people sitting at home who are feeling overwhelmed, uh, there's a lot of people like that who don't necessarily feel like they can take action by talking to their elected officials, but they can do something with their hands. And so we had these um, sewing parties where anybody and everybody, we, um, we had c uh, master sewers and they would teach you how to sew a boomerang bag. And they're very beautiful and they're made entirely out of rescued reuse materials. So no, no resources extracted from the earth to make them. Um, no plants or animals were hurt in the making of the bags. And um, these people felt like they were not depressed anymore. We have all these testimonials of like, you have given us something to do, to do, to help. And so there may be, for those folks at home, um, things like that, where if you're not a person who wants to read, write, or speak to your local officials, you, there is something tangible that you can do to contribute to this. Um, so I hope you, I hope you will find that thing. Totally. Well, I know time is running out here. And so I want to give you one opportunity. Is there something we as a community, the Sullivan Foundation uh, and our broad network 
can do to support you, um, whether it be a link to go check out or something to advocate for or apply back in our own community, what can we do to support your efforts? Oh, thank you very much. Um, so don'twastedurham.org is our website. That's don'twastedurham.org. And you can read about our pro projects. Um, if you're feeling depressed, read about our projects and that might lift you up a little bit. Like we've got people trying to solve these problems and it's good news. And we've got an awesome resources page um, with tools you can use and things that make you feel good about the world. Um, yeah, because they're all based in evidence and they're things we're working on. And then finally, if you feel so inclined to help a wonderful, very progressive, um, vastly underfunded nonprofit, you can contribute to our campaign from now, between now and Earth Day, that will help us move to our wash facility and wash all the things. Because when you think about it, what what is reuse? It's dishwashing. So uh, we can do that with our commercial dishwashers and our drying racks, which we get so excited about. Thank you for asking, Spud. Absolutely. If you want to help make her bulk dishwashing capabilities uh, oh, man. the reality. We'll you put know, your the, name the on the bill, dishwasher. So, Crystal, thank you. Or dishwasher, oh. right? Any of the above. I'm sure she would, she would take any of it, right? So thank you for coming. It's always fun to catch up with you. So I hope you can uh, keep creating ripples down in your area. So you're doing good Thanks work. Thanks so much, but you're very, very supportive as usual. So, well, thank you for joining. So, and we will share all these links with folks afterwards. So you can easily get a hold of Crystal if you need to. Awesome. Bye -bye. See you, Crystal. All right. So don't waste Durham. Uh, if you had a chance to hear Crystal speak, if you're coming in late, we also had Jared from the Biomimicry Institute. Uh, Jared just shared that he's got a bunch of ongoing series for folks that are looking for, you know, creative purpose-driven tasks during this time, uh, you can go check them out there. So feel free to go look up both of their works. Uh, they're doing really good stuff. And if you want to follow us, uh, we'll be going live again next week. Uh, we do this twice a week. We're currently going every Wednesday at noon Eastern time and Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern. So just follow us here on Sullivan Foundation's Instagram page. And if you're looking for any of our previously recorded videos, you can go to Sullivan fdn.org slash webinar. We've got a whole database of all the conversations that we've been hosting over the last couple of weeks, and we'll continue to do so moving forward. So I'm going to head out here. It's a Friday. I'm going to go enjoy my weekend. I hope you all are able to as well. So thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you guys again next week. Ciao, friends.